will uh, come to order. The chair will entertain a motion in a moment, but just to give you a little preview of the draft rule, we'll make in order only those amendments printed in the report. The committee still must decide which amendments to make in order. After the initial motion is read, the chair will entertain further motions that specific amendments be made in order. The Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you yield? I yield to the gentleman from yeah. New York. I'm uh, reading the uh, reading the rule, and it says uh, what you just uh, alluded to. It says no amendments shall be in order except those printed in the report of the committee on rules accompanying this resolution. Where is the report? We haven't decided yet. This is what the markup's about right now. Okay, so we're uh, we're going to go through an, a, um, an amendment process, right. making amendments in exactly. order. Exactly. Oh, fine. Uh, let's go. Okay. <laughs> Thought you'd never ask. All right. First, I'd like to submit the letters from the authorizing committees. Uh, letter from uh, Charles Rose, North Carolina, Chairman of the uh, Committee on House Administration. Uh, stating in effect that uh, uh, he's informed by the committee rules being asked to make an order during floor consideration of the legislative branch appropriations bill for the fiscal year 1994. Various amendments to be offered from the floor which fall within the jurisdiction of the Committee on House Administration. I am concerned that the Committee on House Administration would be foreclosed from considering such matters with the proposed amendments to establish statutory limitations affecting policy made in order. A much more orderly process would include committee consideration and a recommendation prior to floor consideration. I would therefore ask your committee to foreclose floor consideration of any proposed amendment within the jurisdiction of the Committee on House Administration, which would require a waiver of Rule 21, Clause 2, or House Rule 16, Clause 7. Ask unanimous consent that that be made part of the record. Also, I have a similar letter from the uh, Committee on Post Office, uh, Chairman Will Bill, Bill Clay, who uh, in effect says the same thing. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, excuse me. With regard to point of inquiry, with regard to the letter from Chairman Rose, uh, there was an, uh, an attachment to that. Did you ask that that be included as part of the record? Yeah, I, I'm including the whole thing. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a question on that. And I wondered if your copy uh, had uh, the same kind of markings that my copy has. And I'm on the, one of the pages, the one that happens to have uh, my amendments on it, numbers 31, 32, and 33. I notice uh, in front of number 31 uh, in my amendment, uh, there is an initial CHA, which I presume is for the uh, Committee on House Administration. Right. And then I go down to um, number 47, which is an identical amendment to the exception yeah. of a uh, difference between three years and five years, but it nevertheless uh, constitutes a, a limitation. And I'm curious why that would not have a CHA marking or whether the one next to mine... Well, it should have had a CHA marking because it's from the same committee. Excuse me? Yeah, it should have. In yeah. other words, there is an error here. Is that's that correct? Right. Okay. As long as the record shows there's an error, that's fine. Thank you. Well, I mean, it couldn't come from any other committee. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in agreement. I can understand, uh, given the lateness of the hour and the uh, confusion of the number of amendments we've had, that that could have happened. Right. I just wanted to make sure there was evenness here. Uh, let the record show that I put a CHA beside it. Uh, thank you. Let the record show that I acknowledge that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You can pick this up again. The uh, chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 2348 a rule providing one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Appropriations Committee. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill and waives clauses 2 and 6 of Rule 21 against all provisions of the bill except Section 306B. The rule makes an order only those amendments printed in the report to accompany the rule to be considered in order and manner specified. The amendments are not subject to amendment nor to a division of the question. The rule waives clause 2 of rule 21 against the amendments printed in the report. Finally, the rule makes an order one motion to recommit. To the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina, is there any... Mr. Mr. Solomon. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if... Um... If I might, I'm just uh, reading the, uh, the rule we do have before us, and uh, the committee uh, in adopting this rule, which is before us, is deciding against uh, removing the waivers uh, of Clause 2, Rule 21, against existing legislative provisions in the bill, 
except uh, for the one section, I think, which came from government operations. Uh, according to the Appropriations Committee report on this bill, there are at least 31 other provisions contained in the bill uh, that we are waiving uh, those points of order. I think we should recognize at this time that the legislative branch appropriation bill is really a cross between the authorization and an appropriations because we do not act on any other regular authorization for the legislative branch. And that's what's causing all the problems and that's what uh, had uh, this 50 or 60 members uh, on both sides of the aisle parading before this committee today. Uh, that being the case, Mr. Chairman and members, I think it is only fair that we treat amendments the same as this committee has decided to treat existing legislative provisions in the bill by protecting them against points of order. Uh, to do otherwise is to establish a double standard which says that the Appropriations Committee is superior to the House as a whole in determining what legislative matters should be included and protected in the appropriation bill. Now think about that for a minute. In point of fact, the Appropriations Committee, like any other committee, is a creature of this House. The Appropriations Committee, I'll say it again, is a creature of this House and not vice versa. And it is the House, not the Appropriations Committee, which really has the ultimate authority under the Constitution for appropriating money and for establishing limitations on those appropriations. Now, again, think about that. As you may recall, last year, this committee made an order some five amendments which needed Clause 2, uh, Rule 21 waived, but did not protect them with waivers. All five were subsequently knocked out on points of order. That was a very cynical ploy, as, as I see it, whether it was intentionally cynical or not, uh, and I think it should not happen again. I would therefore urge that for the sake of consistency and for the sake of House supremacy over the appropriations process, that the amendments about to be moved would require that that's, that clause to Rule 21 waivers be granted those waivers. In other words, uh, when we offer amendments in a few minutes, uh, all of the amendments we offer uh, to the individual amendments would be printed in the Rules Committee report, would not be subject to amendment, would be debatable for 20 minutes each, and appropriate points of order would be waived uh, from those. That means that all of these other members of the House of Representatives coming before this body today asking for waivers of points of order, would we would be treating them exactly as we are treating members of the Appropriations Committee. And I think that's only fair, Mr. Chairman, and I well, would hope that when we offer these amendments that, uh, that uh, you, you consider the fairness in this issue. Well, the gentleman realizes that uh, the authorizing committees oft times do uh, uh, object to the waiving of rules in some instances, in some instances they don't. In this area, they. They, they were specific where they, they opposed the waiving of the rules, and we're just mm -hmm. working, we usually work mm -hmm. with the authorizing committees on that matter. Okay? Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to yield to my good friend from uh, Tennessee for a, a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Quillen. We uh, had so many members appear before this committee today asking for amendments. The That's right. We have revealed that Many of the freshmen on both sides of the aisle wanted to uh, offer amendments. Mm -hmm. And I think that with that uh, outpouring of requests from the freshman members and those others who appeared before, that we should have an open room. And I see nothing wrong with it. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, I move that we grant an open room with one hour of general debate and uh, no with no waivers and the list uh, which is attached to my request will be made part of the record. The gentleman recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick. Mr. Quillen, of course we're all for open rules on this committee as, as most members Always. of the House, uh, Democrats and the Congress and for the free uh, flow of debate. However, <clears throat> I would have to say to you that this uh, it will not be a closed rule. Uh, I would not anticipate. I would anticipate that it would be a structured rule, and structured in such a way that most, uh, maybe not all, but at least a large part of those uh, uh, matters that uh, Republicans and Democrats are concerned with will, uh, will, will, will be made in order. I might say that uh, 
you know, if we uh, did not have a structure rule, the chances are that we would be here for a week or two uh, debating this bill and probably even then never reach a, a conclusion. Uh, so I would su suspect that we will have a structure rule which will give everyone an opportunity to debate the issues and so forth. Thank you very much. Will the gentleman well, yield? Go ahead. I'd be happy to yield. Uh, I would okay. just say to the gentleman from South Carolina that um, we had a parade of members, and I, I really don't know how many. I, I'm sure there were 50 or 60 members that testified before us today. But uh, one in particular, a gentleman from Ohio named Mr. Fingerhut, uh, he's a freshman, he's a Democrat, and he gave a rather compelling and, and one of the most sincerest uh, speeches that I've heard uh, before this committee or even on the floor of the House uh, today in which he talked about what the American people wanted. They wanted openness with this Congress. They wanted reform in this Congress. And he made a compelling speech that we should put this bill on the floor, that we should let these members who have taken the time and done the research to come before this committee to let each and every one of them have their uh, opportunity to try to uh, represent the 572,000 people he mentioned uh, by number. Uh, on the floor of Congress. And that is not going to happen. Uh, we know uh, that uh, probably seven or eight amendments uh, may be made in order. Uh, most of them, uh, uh, they will be uh, the least important, I feel, that, uh, that, that you could select and thereby say that we're going to have <clears throat> some kind of an open semblance on the floor of uh, this Congress tomorrow. Uh, that's not going to happen. Mr. Fingerhood is going to be uh, uh, disillusioned, and so are the people that he represents, and so are the people around this country, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would just hope that uh, we could uh, honor Mr. Quillen's request for an open rule and let the House work its will. We would be proud of ourselves if we could do that. The gentleman, thank the gentleman. You know, uh, I will respond to Mr. Derrick, a good friend of mine, does a good job. But we haven't done anything this week. We rode on the plane together coming up. Tuesday, we didn't do anything, maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Today, we had maybe an hour on the floor. And uh, to me, uh, uh, saying that this would take a week, really, I don't see anything wrong with it. If we're going to work Tuesday, through Thursday, well, that, I think then we should allow the members an opportunity. There's nothing wrong with that. But we don't set the schedule on the floor. I realize that we don't. But we can't argue with uh, what's going to happen tonight. We know the die is cast. We're going to offer these amendments, and they're going to vote for whatever they want to vote. And the decision has already been made, but so be it. I still insist that we should make this an open route. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Let Derrick. Let me just say this, and, and hopefully we can bring the matter to a conclusion. Uh, this will be a, a, a structured rule. It will not be a completely uh, 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 and be able to take up everything that everybody mentioned before this committee, but much of it uh, will be taken up, and it will be free and open, and people will have an opportunity to, uh, to have their say on the floor. Thank you. On the motion of the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Quillen. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Vote, the noes appear to have it. The gentleman from Tennessee asks for a recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Nielsen. Mr. Cross. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Slaughter. No. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Aye. Mr. Goss? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members having voted in the affirmative, five in the negative, the motion of the gentleman from Tennessee does not carry. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In response to the uh, very compelling argument that my uh, good friend, the distinguished uh, Chief Deputy Majority Whip from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick, made over the time constraints that we have, I would like to move that uh, we uh, strike the waivers uh, in the rule of clauses 2 and 6 of Rule 21, which prohibit uh, legislation 
uh, in an appropriations bill and of Clause 2L6 of Rule 11, which uh, is the three-day layover uh, requirement. And uh, it seems to me that if, if uh, Mr. Derrick is so concerned about this time problem that we have, this would be a very appropriate measure because what it'll do is it will limit uh, the debate on these amendments which uh, violate uh, these rules of the House. And so I think that we could tighten up the time frame here under which we'll consider this measure. And I hope that my colleagues will support it. I, I think if the gentleman would change the word violate to waive, I think it might be more correct. Okay. It'll still save a lot of time if that's our priority. <laughs> I, I would just simply uh, put a ditto on the argument that I gave uh, Mr. Quillen on his same reasons. Well, I think that the argument that, that you just made will actually, uh, uh, what should justify your support of my motion. It's a matter of interpretation. I see. Question comes on the motion of the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. Mr. Chairman. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielenson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Mr. Gordon. No. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman was not recorded. The gentleman was not recorded. Oh. <laughs> On this matter. Four members haven't voted in the affirmative, six members in the negative. The motion, the gentleman of California, is not adopted. Uh, <coughs> Mr. So Chairman, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of our Republican leader, Bob Michael, uh, I would like to uh, move that we make uh, his amendment in order. Uh, his amendment cuts 25% across the board in everything but the Senate, uh, with 12.5% eligible for restoration by March 31st, if approved by the House uh, with programming allowed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you know, Mr. Bob Michael uh, is one of the most respected members of this House. He does not offer uh, amendments unless they are sincere, unless he believes in them. Uh, this, in effect, uh, could result in uh, a maximum of 25 percent being cut across the board from the uh, legislative appropriations. Uh, however, uh, it does provide an out uh, whereby half of that 25 percent could be restored by March 31st if this House of Representatives, in its infinite wisdom, uh, decides to reprogram or restore those funds. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Michael was afraid that this amendment might not be made in order uh, because he feels, as I do, that it would uh, surely pass if it's allowed to come to the floor of the House of Representatives. I think uh, you know that, uh, every member on your side of the aisle knows it, and we know it. And uh, again, he is our Republican leader. Out of respect for him, uh, I would uh, hope that you would make this amendment in order, and uh, I would so move at this time. The gentleman knows that the, uh, the amendment is not in order. Uh, I do? And I was wondering, didn't you? No. There's a, there needs a point of order. Well, I know that, but oh. I'm asking the okay. way Okay, all right. And you probably... Uh, I thought I was supposed to know something I didn't know. No, no, you, you know everything you're supposed to know. <laughs> uh, this uh, also comes in. This, uh, we come in with the amount of $19 million under the 93 appropriations in this account. So we've already cut the, the, the bill in committee. $19 million under the 93 uh, uh, appropriations account. So I, I would think that the 24% cut is not necessary at this time. As you know, there's a four or five year period to which they're going to get to the 25% cut and they're on the right track and they have been, the appropriation, legislative appropriation committee has been cutting back and I'm sure that you'll agree to that. Well, Mr. Chairman, with, uh, with all due respect, uh, I'm not here to debate the amendment. No, I Before understand. Before this committee, we're, we're not here to debate the merits. But uh, I just want to let you know that there has been a substantial cut in this account already by the committee itself. Right. Well, the point is, Mr. Chairman, that we had uh, members on both sides of the aisle, both Democrat and Republicans, coming to this committee wanting the right to, to have these kind of cuts debated on the floor. Now, if you're going to refuse the Republican leader uh, his cut of 12.5 percent, then I assume that... Uh, that all of the other amendments uh, with cuts of that uh, uh, amount uh, are probably going to be turned down as well. And uh, uh, 
Again, Mr. Michael uh, would certainly, uh, uh, if it were the shoes were on the other foot, uh, I'm sure that he would honor Mr. Foley or Mr. Gephardt their wish for their amendment. Uh, and I, again, I'm going to appeal to you to make this amendment in order uh, for the Republican leader, and let's uh, let's let the House vote on it on the floor tomorrow. Well, Tully, if the committee had not cut the amount that it had, uh, this amendment would make more sense, and it's a 24 percent cut, not a 12 percent cut. 25% cut uh, after the 18 million has already been cut out of the budget. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to belabor the issue, but okay. uh, the truth of the matter is it's a, it calls for a 25% cut, but with 12.5% being restored if, if, if the House so saw fit by March 31st, that means it's a 12.5% cut and everybody knows it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we've discussed it and I would move the amendment. Question comes in the amendment. The gentleman from New York, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. And those appear to have it. Respect the clerk will call the, call the roll. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Bielens? Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonnier? Mr. Hall? Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Mr. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. Doss? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, six members having voted in the affirmative. Four in the affirmative. I'm sorry. Six in the negative. The motion of the gentleman from the act is not adopted. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, earlier today, much earlier, I think <laughs> it seemed to be a habit now that we're, uh, we're in session here for seven or eight or nine hours or 14 or however long it took us the last time. But uh, I had uh, testified before this committee asking that you uh, uh, make an order my amendment, which uh, does uh, require random drug testing of legislative employees. And I pointed out in that, uh, that testimony that uh, uh, President Ronald Reagan and George Bush after him uh, uh, carried on the policy of not only testing all White House employees uh, before their employment, but uh, then randomly uh, testing them as well um, uh, as, as, as uh, their tenure continued. Uh, my amendment does not require uh, the uh, testing uh, of every potential employee. It simply would, it would uh, instate uh, that part of the uh, provision that is uh, being done at the White House now, and that is randomly testing uh, congressional employees. Now, I don't have to tell any of you the problem we ran in with uh, uh, cocaine sales earlier uh, uh, last year where some of our legislative employees pled guilty to distributing cocaine. Uh, I think that was a terrible black eye to this Congress. Uh, again, I don't want to get into the, to the, to the details uh, of this, but um, uh, I have a report here, and I, I'm just going to take a minute to read this to you because I think it's uh, it's terribly important. It uh, the direct financial savings to the taxpayers of conducting a drug testing program far outweigh the cost of implementing such a program. Now, a recent study conducted by the U.S. Postal Service determined this is the U.S. Postal Service now, which is quasi-public or quasi-private, whichever way you look at it, uh, determined that the implementation of job applicant drug screening would save the Postal Service how much money? $103 million in the first year alone. That is $103 million in the first year alone with more savings over subsequent years. Now, I think this is the part I want you to understand because this is the part when we're talking about saving taxpayers money or or really utilizing the money that we're appropriating here today. The study concluded that applicants who test positive for drug use were more likely to use leave time than their negative testing counterparts and were 70% more likely to be involuntarily terminated over a three-year period. Moreover, money is saved because new employees do not have to be hired and trained. Think about that. The study was led by Dr. Stephen Salyards, an organization psychologist for the Postal Service in order to determine if drug screening would lower cost and increase the department's efficiency by decreasing turnover and accidents. Now, the results of the study showed that people testing positive for drugs were absent from their jobs 11.4 percent of the time, while negative testers were absent 6 percent of the time. In other words, half the time. The typical drug abusing worker is late for work 300% more often than the non-abuser, requests time off 200% more often than his non-abusing co-worker, has 250% more absences of eight days more than the non-abusing worker, 
is 500% more likely to file a workman's compensation claim, 500% more likely. And positive, text, positive testing employees are 77% more likely to be fired within the first three years of employment. The results are in, in a direct cost-benefit analysis, drug testing in the workplace more than pays for itself. Now, Mr. Chairman, you know, it costs $11 to, to uh, test. I go through that test once a year myself, just to set an example, and I have my employees in my office do the same thing. There is absolutely no reason why we cannot uh, enact this and do the same thing for legislative employees that we're doing in the, at the White House, that we're doing in many agencies throughout the uh, executive branch and uh, the Department of uh, Transportation and the Department of Defense. I will just sum up by saying one time, when we implemented random drug testing in the military back in 1983, 25% of our active military personnel were using some kind of drugs, and they admitted to it. And five years later, that figure had dropped from 25% down to 4.5%. Now, that's, that's an 80% drop. Now, if we could get that in our state legislature, in our, in, our, uh, in our United States House of Representatives, if we could get it throughout government, and we, we could get that throughout the private sector, throughout this country, you know, there would be no more demand for these drugs, and these, these uh, drug distributors would be on welfare stamps, for God's sakes, because they wouldn't be able to earn a living, because there wouldn't be any value to the drugs. So please make my amendment in order. Let's have the opportunity to debate it on the floor. It has been bottled up in the House Administration Subcommittee for the last five years, and we will never have a chance to debate this on the floor. That's the only reason I'm coming before this committee and asking for it today, because there is no other opportunity. Thank you for your indulgence. Mr. Derrick. Uh, this is the wrong place for that. Uh, it's, uh, as you well know, it should be in an authorizing legislation and should be go through the committee process. And, uh, you know, I suggest that you do that. And if it comes back before the Rules Committee, I probably would support it. Mr. Derrick, uh, you know and I know that this bill will never see the light of day. I've got the bill right here, and uh, it is not going to come out of the House Administration Committee, and we will never have an opportunity to uh, debate it other than right now. Well, I happen to be on the House Administration Committee, and I do not know that to be a fact, nor do you. <laughs> Will the general yield? Well, I'd be glad to yield to my friend. I, you know, I, I think that what my friend is offering is an amendment which we have all heard about for years. And Mr. Solomon, if he's known for anything around here, it's for offering these amendments that deal with drug testing. And it seems to me that if we were to proceed with the committee hearing process, we'd hear what we've been hearing from Solomon for years. It seems to me that because we haven't come forward with this up to this point, now is a great opportunity for us to make it in order. And I, for one, am going to vote in, in support of his amendment. Question comes in the motion, gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Nielsen. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonia. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Weed. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chen. No. On this matter, four members having voted in the affirmative, <coughs> six in the negative. The motion of the gentleman from New York is not adopted. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick. I thank the speaker. Uh, I have a, a motion. I move the rule make and order the Shepherd, Goss, Fingerhut, Fowler. How do you pronounce that? Tarkleston. Tarkleston. Tarkleston Amendment number 47 which limits to five years any allowances and expenses for former speakers. This amendment needs a waiver of Clause 2 of Rule 21, and I ask that the rule be waived. The amendment would be debatable for 20 minutes, equally divided. You know, we've had some very fine speakers uh, before this body, and uh, they do need help when they first get out of office to meet commitments that uh, carry on over from their days. and. Uh, I guess probably the third highest office in the country, elective office. But it seems to me that uh, five years should allow them an opportunity to take care of these obligations. 
Therefore, I think uh, the taxpayers need to be relieved of that responsibility after five years, and I so move. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's my time now to retreat gracefully uh, from my uh, amendment and, uh, and not point out that I have had uh, this legislation tied up in the uh, House Committee on Administration for the past two years, but gridlock has indeed uh, been broken, and I am uh, very grateful that it has. Uh, I think that five years is uh, significantly over generous. I thought three was more than generous, but in the spirit of comity uh, and understanding the uh, the uh, the ration that has gone into this, as well as the considerable uh, energies of both sides of the aisle of some of our newer members, I am uh, very pleased to support uh, this amendment. As you well know, Mr. Goss, this was uh, one of the big items that the freshmen had on their their list uh, before the committee. Mr. Chairman, I am aware of that, and, I, and I'm pleased to report to you that one of the reasons that they had it on their list was because some people that we all know and love uh, brought it to their attention. Yes. The gentleman, who has the time? <laughs> I think the, the chairman I, has the time. I think I have the time. I'll uh, be glad to yield to you, Mr. Sullivan. Well, I appreciate it very much, my good friend from South Carolina. Mrs. Shepard, uh, I don't think, came before the committee and, and testified. I know Mr. Torkelson did. Um, no, I think she came at a different time. Was, uh, was she here earlier? Yeah. She was unable, Mr. Chairman, if you'll permit me, she was, Mrs. Shepard was unable to testify on this matter. But, but didn't she come before the committee after, after no, the group had left? So. Not in my presence. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, know she was, I don't yes, think so. I said she, 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 she was here, but not on this, on this issue. Okay. The, the testimony of the record will show on these was uh, Ms. Fowler from Florida, Ms. Torkelson from Massachusetts, and Mr. Fingerhut from Ohio, if okay. I'm not mistaken. Well, that's, that's what raised my question. No, no. I wonder why her name appears, uh, why her amendment is being made in order when she did not appear before the committee testifying for this amendment, but well, Mr. Torkelson and the others did. Yeah, but she was on the amendment, though. She, they, they, I think that there was testimony that she was part of the amendment. Do you want to strike a name from the amendment, Mr. Song? Excuse me? You don't want to strike a name from the amendment? Do you? No, Mr. I don't want to strike. Oh. I just wonder why Mr. Torgelson or, uh, or those that were here testifying, uh, why their amendment wasn't made in order and, and why it was. it was put in her name. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Okay. Now, she, as I understand it, did not testify herself, but uh, others came and testified on her behalf. Uh, okay. All right. Mr. Cool. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Breyer. I, I'd like to just uh, ask a question of uh, Mr. Derrick, if I might. Uh, a very compelling case was made that Mr. Solomon's amendment, uh, to which I referred a few moments ago, uh, was in the administration committee and should not come down until uh, there is a proper hearing there. With all due respect to uh, Mr. Goss, he just said that his was also in the administration committee. And I'd just like to ask, Mr. Goss is a new member of this committee. Why is he treated better than Jerry Solomon? Mr. Dreyer, if you want to vote against this amendment and let speakers continue to have those hundreds of thousands of dollars every year from now on to the end of time, you vote against it. But the, the case I'm making, the, the case I'm making, want to bring this. The case to I'm an making, end. Mr. Derrick, and is that I want to vote in favor of this amendment of Mr. Goss's, Mr. and I also want to make sure that Mr. Solomon's has made an order for drug testing. Mr. Dreyer, if you want to vote against equally. this, if you want to vote against this amendment, if you want to vote against it, you vote against it. I'll and be voting with way, you think, and with Solomon. I think how many ex how many ex Republican presidents are there? I forgot. Speakers. So, so many. No, I'm talking about presidents. Well, presidents. I think we ought to several ought, ought to deal with that. Well, I guess a, the Senate is going to deal with the presidents. I uh, support no, carrying that back too, Butler. Anyway, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I move the motion. Who's going to deal with the drug addicts? That's I'm, what I want to know. Mr. Chairman, I move the motion. Question comes in the motion of Mr. Derrick. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Mr. Chairman, could I have a recorded vote, please? <laughs> Somebody's giving you a historic moment, ladies and gentlemen. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Aye. Mr. Nielsen. Mr. Frost. Uh, aye. Mr. Bonnier. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Mr. Gordon. Aye. I'm sorry. Mr. Gordon. Aye. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Wheat, uh, you're not recorded. Do you want to vote? No. 
Oh, you don't? There's no, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, care to vote present? Members having voted in the affirmative, one present. Uh, the motion of the gentleman of South Carolina is adopted. Mr. Chairman, may I tell you how proud I am to have my name associated with the first time that I've served on this committee on a motion that had that kind of support. I told you things would get better, Porter. I, I <laughs> knew I had to believe you, and I'm glad I did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. Uh, I would like to uh, move uh, my uh, other amendment to uh, cut CRS funds by 5%. I testified that the uh, Congressional Research Service uh, indeed uh, is a wonderful organization. Uh, it deserves, I think, our uh, support. Uh, it gets a tremendous amount of use. It provides material of great value to virtually every member who wishes to use it as a service. But it, too, is part of government, and we are talking about cuts uh, comprehensively. Uh, and I have looked at the uh, cuts that have been taken uh, from the other areas, and it appears to me that an additional 5 percent cut, which uh, adds up to an excess of something like uh, two and a half million dollars, uh, would be consistent with the types of cuts uh, that are being advocating by uh, the fiscal conservatives uh, on our side associated with Mr. Michael uh, in his effort. And it was for that reason I offered. Uh, the uh, cut, it was by no means in any way to suggest that I do not think they are doing a very valuable job. Uh, it recognizes, however, the limits of our affordability in government, uh, and it is very clear that with a $4.37 trillion debt uh, and an annual deficit, uh, an annual debt going um, into the hundreds of billions, uh, that we have to uh, economize our uh, use of these services and the size of our government a bit. Therefore, I make the, the uh, move that the, mo the uh, amendment be made in order. Gentleman from uh, South Carolina, Mr. Mr. Gross, your uh, CRS has already been cut. I'm, I'm aware of that, Mr. Last year's level by $573 million. $573,000. I, I beg your pardon, $573,000. Uh, well, that's not a large agency. I think we ought to leave it at that and, and try to work on it towards. We're trying to work on all of these things to get about a 25 percent cut over the next four or five years. And uh, but I think to do it all right away would, would not be productive. The gentleman would yield back. Uh, I, in, in fact, uh, I, uh, I felt that if this went forward as a, uh, as a uh, amendment, that it, this probably would uh, not pass, that it would have such support because it is such a good service. But I felt in order to be fair in terms of comprehensiveness, that we ought to offer it and get it on the floor. I don't disagree with the statement you're making. I just feel that you cannot single out one agency that is doing a good job and say, therefore, we are going to exempt it from the process. That was my ration. As I pointed out, and as you already knew, they have not been exempted. Exactly. The question comes in the motion of the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Goss. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No, the no's appear to have it. The motion Matt, please adopted. have a recorded vote respectfully, Mr. Chairman, on that. Clerk will call the roll. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bondi. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. <coughs> Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dryer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Four members having voted in the affirmative, five in the negative. The motion to jump from Florida is not adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, um, earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, Mr. Bob Michael, our Republican leader's amendment to uh, cut the uh, across the board by 12.5%, uh, uh, the figure was mentioned of uh, we've already cut $19 million. Right. And, you know, we're talking about a $2 billion budget here, a, a, uh, an appropriation bill. What is it, a, a $1,750 million or what? It's almost $2 billion. And, you know, 10 percent of that is 200 million, and 1 percent of that is, is 20 million. So, you know, 1 percent is not what the American people are looking for here. Uh, Mrs. Dunn, Jennifer Dunn, who appeared before our committee, uh, she's a freshman Republican member from the state of Washington. Uh, she came here to reform this Congress and to live up to what the American people want, and they want this Congress to cut spending and not to raise taxes. 
And she had four amendments, which she had requested before this committee. One would have cut 25% of the investigative staff. The second one would have cut 25% uh, in investigative staff funds, uh, but not allocated among Republicans or Democrats. The third would have cut 25% in the House statutory staff. And the third, fourth would have cut five, just 5% five out of the doorkeeper staff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, these are amendments that uh, many people from both sides of the aisle have uh, paraded for this committee. They want the opportunity to vote on. Uh, I would hope that you would make an order all four, and I would offer the four in block at this time. All right. I want to uh, say to the gentleman that the, the cuts we're talking about are real cuts. I, I mean, this is a 5.8 reduction in outlays. Uh, the 18 point, even though it's 1%, it's 1% less than last year. I mean, it's every, when most things are rising, we, we're just cutting back on it. And I just think that uh, uh, the Appropriations Committee uh, uh, on this matter has uh, made some cuts and, uh, and has promised to make more cuts as, as time goes on and uh, that we'll reach that 25% uh, decrease uh, within the four-year period. But uh, having said that... No, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Clark, no, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh, my district isn't too far away from your district. My district is the Hudson Valley of New York. On the south end, it's 40 miles outside of New York City, has the, uh, the Catskill Mountains on the, uh, on the south Very end. Very beautiful district. On the north end, it's got the beautiful Adirondacks, Lake George, Lake Placid. And I'm going to tell you something. The average person there makes about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a year. And, you know, they don't want to hear this business about outlays. They want to hear cut. Cut, cut, cut. And they want us to do something about it. These, this amendment that I'm offering does that. And, uh, you know, give us the chance to debate it on the floor and let the chips fall where they may. I move the amendment. Question comes in the motion, gentlemen from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's appear to have it. The roll clerk will call the roll. Mr. Garrett. No. Mr. Beals. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Halls. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. Goss? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members haven't voted in the affirmative, five in the negative. The gentleman's motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman? The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Slaughter, for motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the rule make in order the Pomeroy Amendment, number 43, uh, which reduces frank mail allowances by uh, 5.8 million. The amendment would be debatable for 20 minutes, equally divided. Question comes on the motion. Gentleman, the gentlelady of New York. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Solomon. Uh, as I understand it, the uh, Pomeroy uh, amendment reduces frank mail costs by 5.8 million dollars. That's right. And uh, if you recall, uh, we had uh, a member, a new member, a freshman member, a former governor of the uh, state of Delaware come before our committee, and uh, he uh, discussed at length how the American people feel about uh, all this franking business. And uh, he wanted to uh, restrict and restructure the official mail account and uh, to prohibit the transfer of funds from, uh, from uh, the office to mail accounts. And uh, he wants to do away with the frank entirely. He wants to uh, have us use postage just like everybody else, just like you and I did in the uh, state uh, legislatures, uh, so that there wouldn't be any question about this, this franking business and uh, members using it to uh, feather their own nest. And uh, I certainly want to support uh, the amendment that Mrs. Uh, Slaughter is uh, offering to make in order for... Uh, for Ms. Pomeroy, is it? Uh, but I'm just wondering, what is the feeling of the uh, of the committee on the Castle Amendment? Uh, uh, if we make hers in order, are we also going to make the Castle Amendment in order? Will the gentleman uh, yield? Have a chance to vote. I'd be glad to yield the gentleman. I'd say that I'm very much in favor of making the Castle Amendment in order as a member of this committee. Mr. Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman, um, I noticed uh, with some interest, and uh, Ms. Solomon is a friend of mine, and we've uh, agreed on some things and disagreed on other things over the years, but. Uh, I noticed that Mr. Solomon is the uh, second largest user of the Frank on the Rules Committee, that uh, Mr. Solomon uh, 
spent $153,885 on the franc uh, mm -hmm. during 1992. And uh, mm -hmm. it's an interesting position that my friend takes in that uh, uh, he uses the franc uh, more than uh, any of the other Republicans on this committee and more than, uh, uh, more than all but uh, one of the Democrats on the committee. And, uh, and yet uh, he has uh, apparently suddenly gotten religion on the subject. Uh, <laughs> I would only suggest that uh, um, we have made a significant cut in the franc over a period of years. This is the latest in a reduction of the franc. It's, this is a, a real figure. This is millions of dollars that this amendment will take the franc down. Um, quite frankly, uh, I think the franc is, uh, is useful for uh, publicizing town hall meetings and publicizing a variety of things in districts. Uh, and I, I just am uh, struck by the fact that the gentleman apparently in the past has agreed that it's a very useful thing for yield. members to have. Yes. And I also <clears throat> want to show that the, uh, this al already has been cut uh, $1.9 million be below the 1993 budget. Before so this, this would amendment. Before the $55.8 million amendment. Well, let, me, uh, let me respond to my good friend. Uh, uh, there was a... A, a little bit of sarcasm there, maybe not intentional, but uh, let me just explain. Uh, the gentleman I think was here, I think he was presiding, as a matter of fact, when Mr. Castle was here. And uh, we talked about uh, uh, the nature of uh, our districts, talked about mine covering 10,000 square miles, being 270 miles long, and how difficult it was uh, in order to, uh, to get your uh, positions across, let, them, let your people you represent know where you stood. And uh, I pointed out that in the very beginning of every year, I send out a questionnaire district-wide, uh, and I depend on that questionnaire to, uh, to really get the feeling of the people back home. Then uh, I send out a couple of other newsletters during this whole year's period, and that, uh, that uses up because it's district-wide, and they use up a lot of frank uh, in, do in doing that. But I pointed out that uh, many members, they frank their entire voting registered uh, uh, list. Uh, and in doing so, they have it broken down where they can mail to every Irish family, like my good friend Joe Moakley, uh, in their district, and they can target that Irish family to what they want to hear. I hope the, I hope the gentleman is, no, I'm serious, I hope the gentleman doesn't think that I target any ethnic group in my, my thing. In no, fact, if you'll notice... You're all Irish, but you don't have to. No, no, but if you'll notice, I am the lowest frank on the entire committee, so I mean, I, 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 that shows I don't do that, but... No, no, uh, I, I would never... I would never accuse the gentleman okay. of doing that. I'm saying that many members do. And they target so many others. I don't have any targeted lists. I'm proud of it. When I send out a mailing, it goes district-wide. But the point is, I'm willing to sacrifice all that and do away with the, with the frank entirely, uh, if, uh, if everyone else is too. And that's really what I think Mr. Castle was alluding to. And uh, we would still be able to have a lump sum amount of money there, but we wouldn't use it for a frank so. purpose. And I think that's what the American people want. So you. I'm, I'd be glad to yield the gentleman. Let me, let me just uh, make a statement. I, I mean, I think it's very nice that we go through and we could read for the record the amounts that every member of Congress spends on franking to their constituents. But the fact of the matter is, on this side of the aisle, we are making a very sincere attempt to try and reduce that. And Mr. Solomon and all the rest of us will fall within the constraints that the regulation which we impose in this legislative appropriation bill sets forth. And I think that uh, he has not gone beyond the present uh, law on that, what's allowed for him. And I suspect that he's well below many other members of the full House in the level of expenditures for Frank Mail. I think that what we're saying is we want to bring about meaningful change here, and that's the case that Mr. Solomon is making, and I support him in that effort. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Slaughter. may I please state for the record that in, uh, with the cut of $1.9 million that the committee made, and the cut we're recommending with Mr. Pomeroy's amendment, we are actually this year making a point of $7.7 .7 million, almost $8 million. The gentlelady is correct. Would the gentlelady yield on that point? I will. How much is it? I'm sorry. I didn't know who had the time. Yeah, I apologize. Well, Thank you. Uh, the question I had, most of the testimony, we had a lot of testimony, as you know. Uh, we were all here for a long right. time today. And uh, I, I'm not sure that I heard Mr. Pomeroy's uh, testimony. Uh, but. Much of the testimony we did here on franking talked about a 50 percent cut. What percentage would 5.8 million uh, represent? Well, the actual total cut will be 7.7. .7. Well, what would that represent? Just let me get the figure for that. 15 percent. Uh, 15 percent. 15 percent. 
so what, what we're saying is that we feel comfortable uh, in offering an amendment for a 15 percent cut against what was the projected budget figure for the coming fiscal year. No, I think the, the 15 percent. No, what we're saying is that the, the budget for this year has already no. been cut 1.9 million. I, I believe right. it's, uh, and if we cut add from what? Cut from from what had been suggested. From last year? No, last it wasn't year. last year's 93. budget. Yeah. Yield. I believe it's a cut from last year's from fiscal figure. year 93. Yeah, I believe, I believe this, this this one is a cut from last year's figure. So not a projection. Is, and Mr. Pomeroy's is an additional cut, so that the total cut from last year's figure is 7.7 .7 million. So that the we are or talking 15%. about we are talking about a 15 percent cut against the budget figure for franking for last year. Is that correct? Well, the appropriation figure for last year. Thank you for the clarification. And, well, let me clarify it a little bit further, if I may. I, I spoke on the five point. If the five point eight million, it's a fifteen percent cut. The seven point seven per, uh, million cut is even higher than fifteen percent. Do you have the exact number? Yeah. We don't. If the gentleman so will, around 18, 18, we'll, 18, we'll, 19. I think we'll all agree it's not fifty percent cut. But I mean that. Uh, that the, 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 what I'm trying to do is get the range. We've had a lot of testimony on a lot of amendments, and we are going to have to talk to a lot of people who have co-signed bills and gotten involved in amendments. And this, this is not a new subject, as everybody knows. And I think we need to be in a, in a position to explain, uh, for many of those who are here, did ask for a 50 percent cut, because that seemed to be a, a, an agreeable figure when you got into the mass, the unsolicited mass mailing number. So this would not preclude unsolicited mass mailings uh, in uh, the gentlewoman's opinion, I presume. No, but it, neither would it preclude the people who want a 50 percent cut from taking it. Understood. That's right. that's very clear. They, 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 could, they could cut theirs out 50 percent or 100 percent. Oh, you don't have to use any. You Everything. can cut it 100 percent. Yeah, the, the gentleman would yield. This would permit Mr. Solomon to, consent, to continue to send his legislative questionnaire to all his constituents, and it would permit Mr. Solomon or any of the others of us to continue to send town hall meetings to notices to all of our constituents. That's correct. And answer our mail, which is considerable. Uh, I understand that. The, the other area that I want to make sure I am clear on in this, uh, besides the amount of the cut and what we've done with the unsolicited mass mailing in this amendment, uh, this amendment does, in, does not in any way address, I presume, the aberration in the scale uh, in the pattern of franking that we saw perhaps uh, best represented in testimony of Mr. Thomas of California today. Uh, that uh, in the election year cycle, we generally see the uh, doubling of the uh, franc expenditure as opposed to the non-election year, where it's uh, generally about half as much. Is that correct? As I recall Mr. Thomas's testimony, he said that we had seen a change, that we were not having that bump in the election year. We, we have very clearly, that's why I'm asking the question, we have very clearly seen a change uh, as a result of the, uh, of the cuts previously taken. Well, I believe it's because of the accountability uh, that we now see. Well, the cuts as well, though. They've been well, maybe, maybe the cuts as well. I think, in the last six years. But the, the point I'm trying to make is there's nothing in the Pomeroy Amendment which is going to address the pattern of expense. Is that correct? There is not. It merely is a That's left to the member. F approximately 18 percent cut over last year's budget in the franking. Is that right, correct? Correct. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate You're it. Very welcome. Question comes now on the motion. The gentlelady from New York. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Oh, you want a roll call? The gentlelady oh, calls another roll one call. of those roll call votes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Historic. Aye. Mr. Beals. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bond. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat, present. Mr. Gordon, Miss Law, Mr. Solomon, aye. Mr. Quillen, aye. Mr. Dreyer, aye. Mr. Goss, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. <coughs> Eight members having voted in the affirmative, one present, one uh, one abstaining. Uh, the motion of the gentlelady from New York is adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to say that it's been a great privilege to just this evening become a member of the Legislative Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, I'd like to, at this time, uh, offer the amendment of my distinguished colleague from California, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Frost made a very compelling case just a few moments ago for the Thomas Amendment. It seems to me that when he was looking 
at the beneficial aspects of frank mailing the first item that he mentioned is the one that mr thomas testified today here should be in order that being town hall meeting notifications and uh, we've talked about the testimony that he provided as far as the increase in frank mail in the off year er, during the election year and uh, the, the thrust of his amendment is a very good goal of allowing us to respond to people who contact us with follow-up mailings, but we would not be able to send out these massive uh, newsletters, which are interpreted by many to be nothing more than campaign pieces. And I think that Mr. Frost should be in support of Mr. Thomas's amendment in light of the fact that he underscored the importance of town hall meeting notices, which would be made in order under this amendment. And I hope that we can allow for it. Happy to yield to my good friend from uh, South Carolina. This is legislation on appropriation bill. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, the member, you know, what I think we need to make clear is that the member would not be prohibited from sending out these notices. It's just a matter of what he wants to spend his, uh, his, his, uh, his funds for. And, uh, you know, there is nothing that keeps uh, a member from disciplining himself. There is nothing in any of this legislation that tells them they have to go out and spend this money. I think the problem is that there are many members who don't apply any discipline to themselves or their offices, and that's really the well, goal then, of what then, we have then, here. And while my friend process, raised then, the issue then, of process, legislating an appropriations then. bill, we have made an, we're, it appears that we're going to be making an order in this rule uh, waivers that will allow this amendment to be uh, considered. The uh, Well, then their constituents should discipline they're not willing. If they're going to spend most of their funds and all that, then they're... Based on that theory, we should provide a blank check to members. There should be no constraint whatsoever on there the amount of mail that they should there send there out. There is a limitation, uh, but within that, within It within seems that to be rather excessive based on the things I've heard from my constituents. I asked to, uh, to use this. Uh, Gentleman Neal, uh, actually, I think uh, many people, as a result of C-SPAN, are seeing what... Uh, type of money is used for franking, and I think that uh, they probably can watch what their legislators do and, and uh, how much money they spend on franking. I think that would be something that Mr. Chairman, probably I, brought into the purview of their uh, political decision. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I know that that is the case, and there are people who have been harshly criticized for abuse of the frank. But it, and I have no idea where I stand on that list. I know I would I've you like to know. Some, I'd be happy to. To, uh, uh, you uh, have spent $94,265. Uh, and where do I Which stand? Which to juxtaposed uh, to other... 53.56 of yours. Uh, you're one of the, uh, you're probably about in the middle. About, about in the middle. middle. You're not, I, uh, there, there are several If we could pass this several amendment. several people on the committee that have spent uh, substantially less than you have. Our chairman has spent uh, just $12,000. Mr. Goss uh, had uh, spent about the same thing you have. Mr. Quillen has spent... Uh, the least of all, he spent eight thousand seven hundred seventy-two dollars. So uh, you know, it's been here for twenty-eight well, years. Ninety-nine percent recognition factor. Right uh, well, Chairman, I'm happy to yield. Yes, Mr. Quillen. I heard you say that you spent less than anyone. Uh, I said on the side. No, no, Mr. Quillen has spent. Yeah, on this side. Yeah, that's right. Oh, oh I'm oh. sorry. All right, uh, maybe I did. Uh, I, I, I beg uh, to differ. Mr. Quillen. Well, that means that we all got something to look forward to as we become more senior on this committee, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it seems to me that, uh, that if we were to make this amendment of Mr. Thomas's in order, it would give us all the opportunity to uh, successfully attain the positions that Mr. Moakley and Mr. Quillen have been able to do voluntarily. And uh, I move that we make this amendment in order. <laughs> Question comes on the motion of the gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonya. Mr. Hall. Mr. No. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chen. No. Four members have not voted in the affirmative, five in the negative. The motion of gentleman from California is not adopted. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dreyer. Uh, I move that we make in order the uh, amendment that uh, Mr. Roberts has offered. 
I wasn't here for his testimony today, but I heard what I think was almost identical testimony provided before our Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. It has to do with legislative service organizations, and his amendment would ban funds for legislative service organizations with the exception of the Democratic Study Group and the uh, Republican Study Committee. And it seems to me that as we look at this issue, it has been debated here. It's been debated for the past several years because Mr. Roberts has regularly come forward with this recommendation. The reason that I hope very much that we will make his amendment in order is that if he said the same thing here today that he said before our Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, he described it as a major scandal uh, in the making. Did he say something along that line here? I'd like to yield to my friend from Florida. I think that he was very concerned about the lack of oversight. We had a good colloquy on that uh, in the record. And I think that's the lack of oversight responsibility of how can, uh, how can $7 million be out there not accounted for uh, they, the money may, in fact, be safe. It may not be. We just don't know. Uh, and his other point on that, of course, was that uh, there is obviously a better use for that money at a time when we're making cuts and uh, uh, asking sacrifice for members to give up employees and so forth than have sitting in an LSO account somewhere. But the main problem was when he showed us the list of some of the expenditures of those LSOs, uh, things like $891.38 for a staff travel to the Virgin Islands over New Year's or something, and a $4,000 pastry bill from Watergate, uh, obviously for some type of entertainment. The, you know, a whole list, a yellow page of that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't think any member of this committee or any member of the House wants to be put in a position of uh, just continuing a practice yeah. where that kind of sloppiness is ongoing. And it, it seems to me that we ought to have this amendment made in order so at least those uh, LSOs that uh, want to defend themselves have the opportunity to get their ammunition out there on the well of the floor. I thank my friend. And I think You'll the back. point that needs to be made here is that we're not allowed in our office accounts to expend dollars in the way uh, which my friend from Sanibel has just outlined. And it seems to me that we shouldn't be taking money from our office accounts and sending them to organizations which do provide that kind of abuse of taxpayer dollars. I'd also like to uh, make an order Mr. Porter's amendment, which would bring about reform of LSOs and block, if I could, with this uh, Roberts amendment, Mr. Chairman. Um. Uh, you know, <clears throat> as far as I, none of us, of course, uh, would condone some of the things that you have uh, just mentioned. I'm not sure they've happened, but I guess probably they have at one time or another in the past. And uh, I would like to ask you to, to offer these amendments separately. I, I think the Porter Amendment is probably the more prudent way and the logical way to head towards this. As you know, the Porter Amendment would authorize the House uh, administration by January the 1st, uh, 94, to develop regulations for overseeing the financial activities of the LSOs. And this seems to be uh, more prudent to me, and I think probably you would find support on the committee for that, uh, doing it that way. But and I would, in view of that, would like to ask you to, uh, to well, split I'd, them up. I'd like to move these in block. I mean, I know we have time constraints here in this committee. It's now nearly 8.30, and well, there that, are people that who want right to get moving. That is right to do it, but you're going to just take up more time. Oh, well, I mean, I'd like I mean, to offer them in block, I mean, and if we can consider them that way, then we problem. can speed up the process here. Just make them both in order, and we won't have to have another amendment. Question comes from the motion. Gentleman from California, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, no. The no's record appear to have it. The motion not adopt the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Beelan. Mr. Cross. Okay. No. Mr. Bonnier. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Uh, Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members having voted in the affirmative, five in the negative, the motion, gentlemen, California is not adopted. Mr. Dreyer. Uh, I move that we uh, make, and I'd like to move that we do this in block at this point, because we are under, I mean, it's 8.30, the House is in recess, waiting our uh, deliberations up here before we can file the rule. And I'd like to move that we make, uh, in order, in block, the Cox Amendment, which reduces funding for the General Accounting Office to $330 million and reduces by 25 percent the overall and specified amount accounts. And he had provided that list to us earlier. 
the Upton Amendment, which changes the formula for frank mass mail limits to reduce from 3 to 2 the first class mass mailing allocation or reduce from 3 to 1.5 the first class mass mailing allocation. The Fowler Amendment, which requires monthly public statements on members' franking accounts. Uh, we've pretty well taken care of that here in the Rules Committee tonight uh, by outlining the uh, amounts, but this would actually make a monthly allotment of it. And then the very sweeping Inglis Amendment, which reduces frank mail appropriation by $12 million, a little more than the amendment that was uh, discussed by my friend from New York, Ms. Slaughter, prohibits departing members uh, from purchasing the equipment in their offices, eliminates the attending physician's office, and uh, reduces funds for the botanic gardens, and reduces committee statutory staff funds by 60 percent. All four of these amendments are geared towards reducing taxpayer spending, and I think we should make them in order to at least allow all of our colleagues to join with us in considering these amendments on the House floor. And I'm, I'm offering these four in block, and I hope no one objects to my offering them in block. I'd like to do it so that we can move things along and, and get onto these other amendments. Point of clarification, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not sure that my colleague and distinguished friend uh, from California was in the room, but uh, would the record show whether or not the reduction of funds for Botanic Gardens was pulled as an amendment or not before it was testified to today? I, my recollection is that it, that it was pulled. In light of that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent that since the amendment hasn't even been proposed here, that I uh, be able to withdraw that provision. I don't Mr. know why that should stop you. <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't offered as an amendment, and I'm not uh, offering that amendment myself. So since no member has chosen to offer uh, an amendment that would reduce funds for the Botanic Gardens at this point, I'm not going to be the one to step forward. Okay. Mr. Frost. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Dreyer was here. I, I don't recall because I, I was presiding. But I was Mr. Quillen. Uh, made a fairly uh, eloquent statement in opposition to the amendment dealing with the attending physician's office based upon his own personal experience. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, the, the case that I would make here is that I think that Mr. Quillen probably has a, a compelling case that could be made, but all I'm requesting is that we ha have the opportunity for our colleagues to, to uh, deliberate uh, over that on the House floor. The gentleman yield. Happy to yield. I, I, I would simply say that I couldn't agree more with the gentleman from Texas that Mr. Quillen made an extremely compelling case. Uh, I was unable to, uh, in fact, uh, add what I think is an even more uh, compelling uh, personal anecdote. I believe uh, that the gentleman from Texas participated also that we had need for the attending physician in this room not long ago. Right. Uh, it seems to me that the place to let this all come out uh, is on the floor. Uh, and let Mr. Quillen uh, articulate and be eloquent on the subject there. Uh, and, and so I think that this is an excellent amendment. Uh, happy to yield. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Happy to yield. The only problem we're going to ask for a vote on uh, the in block amendment, and I don't agree with the elimination of the attending physician's office. You want you to separate? I do agree with the other separate. part of it. Therefore, you. We've eliminated the funds for the Botanic Gardens. I would move that we eliminate the funds for the attending physician. That's fine. I'm happy to uh, do that out of respect. Without objection. Question now comes on the motion with the uh, modification. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's appear to have it. Can you have a record vote? Mr. Court, call the roll. Mr. Barrett. No. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonnier? Mr. Hall? Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. Goss? Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, Four members having voted in the affirmative, five in the negative, the motion, gentlemen, is not carried. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, uh, I had mentioned before that the former governor of the state of Delaware, Mr. Castle, had come before this committee asking to, uh, to abolish the Frank altogether and to uh, prohibit the transfer of funds from office to uh, mail accounts. We've already debated that, really. There's no sense to uh, repeat it. Uh, but uh, at this point, I would move uh, to make his amendments in order. Question comes in the motion, gentlemen from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's appear to have it. Recorded Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonnier. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Solomon. No. Mr. Quillen. No. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Solomon. No. Mr. Quillen. No. Mr. Dreyer. No.
Mr. Wheat, Mr. Yeah. Gordon, Ms. Slaughter, yeah. Mr. Solomon, Aye. Mr. Quill, Aye. Mr. Dreyer, Aye. Mr. Goss, Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Ms. Uh, four members having voted in the affirmative, five in the negative. The motion, gentlemen, is not adopted. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dreyer. I move that we uh, make in order the amendment that was proposed by a gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Hoke, which would eliminate funding for the historical society calendars. Now, I know we all uh, see these calendars. I think there's one hanging in the office right out here. They are absolutely gorgeous. And the uh, National Geographic Society does a spectacular job with their <coughs> photographic team and taking pictures of this wonderful city and uh, other historic landmarks. But it seems to me that the taxpayer dollars could be better expended on a number of other priority items, and I think Mr. Hoke's amendment should be made in order. Question comes in the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, no. The no's appear to have it. Clerk will call the roll. No. Four members haven't voted in the affirmative five in the negative. The motion, gentlemen, is not adopted. I, I want to tell you that, that this uh, account that we just voted on came in $7.8 million under the 93 appropriations. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dreyer. Um, I move that we make in order the amendment offered by our colleague from New Jersey, Mr. Zimmer, which uh, would prohibit refilling elevator operator positions and abolish all in two years. His goal, of course, is to, to recognize. I, I think a number of us have our offices in the Cannon office building, and I love the elevator operators that we have there. They're some of the nicest people around, but I, and I respect them, but frankly, I find that the elevator seems to move even more efficiently when they're not on it. And I'm able to get it to rush over here to these important rules committee meetings. Yeah. And so I think that we ought to consider the, uh, right. I know some of my colleagues in the, in the Cannon building have their offices on lower floors. I'm way up on the fourth floor, so I have to use the elevator all the time. And it seems to me that, that we should at least allow for a full debate on this issue, as has been done in the past. Uh, I remember when uh, now Senator, our former representative, Hank Brown, offered this amendment several times. And I don't think we should deny Mr. Zimmer the chance to offer this <coughs> amendment in this measure, and I hope we can make it in order. Uh, Mr. Dark, most of the elevators, as the gentleman knows, in, in the complex of the federal buildings around here uh, associated with the House and the Senate do not have operators in them. It's my understanding that uh, each Members building... Only. Huh? Only the members only elevator. Only the members only elevator, which is about one one in, in, in each building, has that operator. No, I don't maybe it's more than that in the uh, yeah. in the uh, in our cannon building, the, I know that we, we have anyway, elevator the operators long, there the long and short, members only. The, the long and short of it is they've been cut back over the years. And the reason these operators are there <laughs> are to facilitate the members getting over here in time to vote. And also, quite frankly, to make it better for tourists and people who visit the capital uh, to get around and, and, the, and not... Anyway, that's all. Okay. Suffice it to say, after this evening, I will be climbing the stairs in the Cannon House office building, but uh, I still hope we can make this amendment in order. Yeah, I would recommend it. It's good for your health. <laughs> Thank you. Question comes in the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. The motion not adopted. The clerk, call the roll. Mr. Garrett. No. Mr. No. Mr. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dryer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Four members haven't voted in the affirmative. Five in the negative. The motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dryer. Our uh, freshman colleague, Roscoe Bartlett of Maryland, uh, has made a, uh, offered an amendment which would provide something that I think has a great deal of common sense to it. It would say there'd be a 50% reduction in our salaries if we fail to, uh, if members pay, if all appropriations bills have not been passed by the beginning of the fiscal year. I think that provides uh, the carrot and stick approach to those of us who serve in the Congress to make sure that we get our work done. 
and i suspect we'd have a very interesting and vigorous debate on this measure um, if we were to uh, if we were to uh, have it considered on the house floor and i move that we make it in order well you know the appropriations bills are always or at least they have been for the last several years uh, done before the beginning of the fiscal year. And with that the, means we wouldn't one, see a reduction with one, with in pay. one exception, and that is when, in 1990, when uh, President Bush uh, encouraged us uh, to get together with that thing that he said he wasn't going to raise taxes, and then he uh, mm -hmm. changed his mind. And I respect him for that, because times do change and, and situations do change. I don't, don't hold that against him uh, at all. But uh, it just, I mean, you know, this is another one of these amendments. You know. We need qualified people in this body. And qualified people have to make enough money to take care of their families, educate their children, and do other things like that, and live in the Washington area and to have a, uh, a home or a residence back home. All I'm asking and, is and, that Mr. Well, Bartlett had a chance to offer his amendment. And, uh, and, and you know, members of Congress are well paid, but they are paid on the level with lower to mid-level executives in most corporations in this in this country. And I think to, to do something like this is, you know, kind of childish, frankly. Well, I'm simply uh, proposing that we allow the amendment to be considered on the House floor. Question comes on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. No. Aye. The no's appear to have a clerk call the roll. Mr. Garrett. No. Mr. Thielen. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bond. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. Yeah. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members haven't voted in the affirmative, five in the negative. The motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Uh, in the interest of time, I would propose that we uh, consider in block the Ridge Amendment, which would restrict funds for the House Inspector General unless uh, given certain duties, and the Grams Amendment, which would prohibit select committees from becoming legislative service organizations, strike funding for Democratic Personnel Committee and Office of the Clerk, and prohibit funding to move members' offices during fiscal year 1994. Question comes in the motion, gentlemen from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. <coughs> Opposed, no. No. The no's appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. We have a record vote. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Garrett. No. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonney. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members haven't voted in the affirmative, five in the negative, the motion is not adopted. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. Earlier today, much earlier, seven or eight hours ago, uh, Mr. Rick Santorum of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, appeared before this committee requesting three uh, amendments that uh, make an awful lot of sense to me. Uh, one amendment would uh, commission and make public the independent financial audits of all accounts and operations of this house uh, I think that's uh, an extremely good amendment that uh, uh, we should be considering in congressional reform and we ought to debate it on the floor tomorrow another one would be to rescind the 94 funds for and to privatize the house restaurant system the house post office the barber shop and the beauty shop and the folding room and uh, one that I'm particularly interested in myself, which would rescind unspent house funds from leftover 1991-1992 accounts and require past and future unspent funds to be returned to the Treasury. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I pointed out that uh, in the years that I have been here, I have tried to return to the Treasury every, uh, every year uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 percent of the funds that uh, are authorized for my office. And uh, that, uh, that's accumulated to, I don't know, three quarters of a million dollars over a period of years. And uh, it's sort of disheartening to know that those funds 
do not actually go back to the Treasury and uh, be used for deficit reduction. And uh, a lot of people, I think my good friend Ms. Slaughter made a point that, uh, well, the funds aren't really there in a wheelbarrow, and they're, they're not as such. But uh, the truth of the matter is when those funds are authorized and appropriated, uh, and then they are not used by that particular member, uh, the funds do accumulate uh, on paper. And I think that's the point that uh, Louise was trying to make. But the point is that the funds are still there, they're still authorized and appropriated, and they can be reprogrammed for other uses. And the point being that uh, as long as those monies are still there and still authorized, that uh, the uh, appropriators, uh, without the approval of, uh, of the individual member, can uh, reprogram that money. And uh, as a form of belt tightening and to make sure that those funds could never be used for any other purpose, if we were to make this amendment in order and enact it into law, uh, then we would really know that when we did tighten our belt, we did not use those funds, that they would definitely go back to the Treasury and be used for deficit reduction. So uh, I think that's a, 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 an excellent amendment that would certainly make the point uh, for all of us to set the example. And uh, I would hope that you would make this amendment, these amendments in order. And uh, at the appropriate time, I would so move them and block. Question comes on the motion, gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The, the noes have it. The motion not adopted. Mr. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Devin. No. Mr. Bielinger. Mr. Foster. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Matter, four members having voted in affirmative, five in the negative, the motion not adopted. At this time, I move the rule and order the English Stupac Amendment number 53, which rescinds $730,037.41 in fiscal year 1991 funds and eight. $191,717.36 in fiscal year 1992 funds. Uh, this amendment needs a waiver of Clause 2, Rule 21. I ask that the rule be waived and the amendment would be debatable for 20 minutes equally divided. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Mr. Salt. I'm trying to identify this amendment. Where, where, whose amendment is this? It's 53. number 53. We don't have a 53. Uh, what sheet are you working off of? Okay. Here. Where did this sheet come from? Oh, I've, I've not had one of these tonight. Well, that's, uh, well, that's one of the amendments adopted. We probably English stew pack. Yeah. Were you here when they testified? Karen English. Okay. Uh, no, I think I was in the uh, okay. in the outer room there. Uh, so. Uh, now, you say you're waiving points of order against this? That's right. So I can send money back to the Treasury. Well, I think Mr. Derrick just made an impassioned uh, argument against uh, waiving points of order. What was that amendment? I'm sorry. It's, not le it's a rescission. It's not legislation. Excuse me? It's a rescission. Well, so what? No, I'm just saying it's a rescission. So, so it doesn't require <laughs> it doesn't require waiving points of order? Is that it? I'm trying to... Can I have that piece of paper back? We'd like a copy of it. Uh, no, uh, this is uh, what? <laughs> my piece of paper. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the only reason it needs a waiver because it wasn't included in the bill that was reported. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Say that again, please. I'm sorry. Mr. It wasn't included in the bill as reported. That's why it needs a This is additional to the cuts so that, that was made in the appropriation bill. So it needs a, so it needs a waiver. Yeah. Well, I wish you'd felt that way about the Solomon Amendment on random drug testing, but uh, uh, how much does this, uh, this save? About $1.5 million. I thought it said 750000 Well, that's one year. 730000 one year, 180000 oh, that's what I wanted. How, how much for one year? 738000 yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks, thanks for the piece of paper. Oh, it's the amendment. <laughs> I know, but uh, Mr. Derrick wouldn't, wouldn't even give us a piece of paper here. But, uh, okay. It saves 738000 for this coming fiscal year. That's why I need to know. Okay. No, 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 no. no. no it's, it's fiscal 91. Fiscal 91. It's 91 and 92. Mm -hmm. Add them both together, and you come up with $1.5 million. Oh, well, okay, $1.5. Let me just put that down. $1.5 million. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman.
Yes, Mr. Uh, on your amendment, uh, I was here for the testimony on that, and if I'm not mistaken, I made the observation that that was uh, very parallel to what Mr. Santorum was proposing that uh, Mr. Uh, Dreyer or Mr. Solomon just offered, mm -hmm. and I, I just wonder if it wouldn't be in the interest of fair play to include Mr. Um, Santorum. Uh, as one of the uh, authors of this effort, because he yeah. very clearly uh, had the same idea and uh, testified, I think, as eloquently as uh, uh, as uh, Honorable Mr. English and Honorable Mr. Stupak, or other way around, Honorable Ms. English and Honorable Mr. Stupak, excuse me. Um, and well, I just I, wonder I, if you consider that. I wasn't uh, here, uh, I was here for the English Stupak uh, testimony. I didn't hear Mr. Santorum. It, it, it's oh, yeah, same, same issue. Oh, yeah. I said I wasn't here. Oh, mm. oh okay. Yeah. Well, I, 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 made, I made the point, and I was here, and it seems to me it's the same thing in the interest of fair play. I think, I think Mr. Santorum would be happy to be associated with it. I want to thank the, uh, thank the chairman for passing out their list that Mr. Derek, Derek would, uh, would not share with me here. But uh, uh, this, 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 does, this does have the 53 on there. I appreciate that. We will call the... Uh, Ms. English in Mr. Stupak's office to see if, if it's the same type thing. But I, I think a, a, a bar bipartisan approach to this would be very much in order. Doesn't bother me, but as I say, I wasn't here for this. I understand from counsel that they're not the same, that Mr. Santorum gets into other rescinded funds, so it's not the same language. I, I accept that explanation. Okay. Thank you. Question comes in the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The uh, eyes have it. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Uh, Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. <coughs> Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. <coughs> Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. On this matter, nine members have been voted in the affirmative. Zero in the negative. The motion is adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Uh, I move the rule making order the Grams Amendment Number Three, which would prohibit it use, would prohibit use of funds for moving expenses. Uh, this limitation amendment needs a waiver of Clause Two, Rule Twenty One. Now I ask that the rule be waived. The amendment would be debatable for twenty minutes, equally divided. Question comes on the motion of the gentleman from Texas. No, 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 Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. What? Sure, I just want to ask, is this this was one provision in the amendment that I proposed. I just was, that you had an in block amendment. Right. This is like one the, of the amendments. I think he, he had proposed three on the, LSOs. And the, this is only the one only the one dealing with moving expenses. It's number three on the list. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, how much does this save in uh, fiscal ninety four? Uh, depends how many people are going to move. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the telephone bills have been outstanding, you know, when you move offices, they mm -hmm. just... Of course, this was, this was offered by a member on your side well, of the no, aisle. Yeah. No, and, I'm just uh, keeping track of something here. Yeah, and no. I, I was... Oh, I'm uh, going to add them up at the end of this uh, debate. Yeah, I was not present for his actual testimony, but we do think it is an appropriate amendment to be made. Don't See, don't what know. happens if one office becomes vacant, you could have ten people moving, you know, mm -hmm. everybody moves up. So this way here, the member would have to stay in that mm -hmm. office until the end of that term mm -hmm. and then be uh, put his name in the... The list uh, when the new class comes in. Do you all have hearings in the administration committee on this? No. I'm not aware that we have, no. Oh, him. Yeah. I'm sorry. So we are waiting for the Mr. Goss? I, I, I just want to make sure I understand. It's the potential uh, for a freshman to, to actually end up in a Rayburn office with a capital view is one of the possibilities of this. Does everybody understand that? Uh, if. If for a limited period of time. For a limited period of time. Yeah, I understand that. The, 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 low, the, lowest, the newest member could end up in the, the, the highest member's office if there was a vacancy and stay in that office until it came time to reassign new freshman class that came in. And then you kick yes. him out of the office? Yes. <laughs> then it would be a <laughs> big... <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Let's that makes sense. You're going to kick him out of an office you put him in? Well, he's only going to be there until the next class comes in. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman I again... I never heard of such a thing. I, well, I again, well, think about it. I mean... Kick him out of the office? <laughs> if I may. Oh. 
Mr. Frost. If I, if I may, I would again point out that this is offered by a member on your side of the aisle, Mr. Solomon. Right. I, I think if you think it's funny, you should talk with the member on your side of the aisle and put no, it in. No, I don't think he intends to kick him out of his when office. I it. You're, you're, you're establishing legislative intent. I don't see where he kicks him out of his office. Well, because the funds are only limited for FY94. You mean we, we don't have to choose to move every time? No, but what if a new class comes in? I stay where I am. That's fine, but why would a... Uh, say that you would like this office, this freshman moved in. Wouldn't you like to bid on it? Mr. Graham, when I talked to him about this amendment, had no intention of that member moving. In other words, if he's going to occupy that office, he can occupy that office for the next 30 years. Where does it say in the amendment that, uh, that he has uh, to move? Under his amendment, it's only restricted to the year 1994. But he... F-94 well, dollars, so that's not gonna argue all it Mr. covers. But uh, Mr. Graham's intent, legislative intent, is to... Mr. Graham's legislative intent is for that member to occupy that office. It doesn't make any sense to kick him out of the office three months after he's occupied it and yeah, tell him he has to move someplace else. The question Mr. comes Chairman, from the motion. Like all those no, we're not through debating. What's that? I'd like to move into your office in the Cannon Building. Well, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Just uh, run for office, and if you get elected and I don't, you can have the office. If Thanks. Mr. Solomon doesn't object. <laughs> I object. <laughs> question comes on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Uh, Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion's adopted. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Uh, Mr. Bielensen. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dryer. Aye. Mr. Goff. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Eight members haven't voted in the affirmative. One in the negative. The motion is not, uh, the motion is adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mm. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Tim Penny appeared before this committee many hours ago and uh, asked to have an amendment made in order that would reduce all amounts in the bill by 5%. Um, uh, Mr. Penny is one of the respected members of this House. Uh, he is noted as being fiscally responsible, and uh, he deserves to have the right to offer that amendment on the floor, and I would so move. Uh, the gentleman uh, is aware, I, I, I believe, that the uh, appropriation committee had already cut this uh, bill by $18.9 million below fiscal year 1993 uh, uh, figures. Mr. Chairman, with, with all due respect, you know, uh, uh, just so everybody will know, we've been here since, uh, what time did we come in this morning? Uh, 11 o'clock. And it's now 9 o'clock. That's about uh, 10 hours or so. And uh, after hearing all of these members parade before this committee offering amendments to cut and to slash and to uh, uh, reduce this legislative budget, what we have done here all evening now, we have approved four amendments. We approved a Shepherd Amendment, which cuts zero out of next year, we, uh, a Democrat amendment. We approved a Democrat amendment for Mrs. Pomeroy that cuts $5.8 million out of a one point. Eight billion dollar budget. We approved. Wait one minute. I'll finish, and then I'll yield to you. Uh, we approved uh, an English amendment on the floor, which will save 1.5 million dollars, and a Graham amendment, which could save uh, zero dollars. When you add up all of these, these four amendments, all we have allowed to be debated on the floor tomorrow, are amendments that would cut at a maximum about seven million dollars out of a one out of a two thousand million dollar budget. $2,000 million, that's what $2 billion is. Now, you know, not to allow Mr. Penny the opportunity to, to offer this amendment, I think is absolutely a slap in the face to the members of this body. If the gentleman would give me a chance. We'll now, well, first I have to yield to my friend, Mrs. Slaughter. I just wanted to make the correction I made before, that with Pomeroy, the total cut is $7.7 .7 million. <laughs> okay, let's move it up a couple million. As old Everett Dirksen said once, you know, a million here and a million there. Boy, is he outdated. Now it's a billion here and a billion there, and we save nothing. Question comes, question comes in the motion of the gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, no. Uh, no. The no's appear to have call it. Vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielsen. This means we Mr. save Mr. nothing. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Sure. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Come Gordon. On. Ms. Swan. Mr. Solomon. Uh, we're, we're voting on the Penny Amendment. Aye. 
Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members have been voting affirmative, five in the negative, the motion not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Derrick. Mr. Chairman, I move the rule making order the Porter Amendment number 17, which would authorize House administration by a date certain to develop regulations to oversee LSOs. There have been some, there's been some confusion. This is a freestanding amendment. It is not an amendment to the Roberts Amendment. The Porter Amendment needs a waiver of Clause 2, Rule 21. I ask that the rule be waived. The amendment would be debatable for 20 minutes, equally divided. The gentleman yield. Be delighted to yield. Thank my friend for yielding. I'd just like to say that I believe that this is a very worthwhile amendment, and I enthusiastically support my friend's effort. Would, would the gentleman yield? Thank you. Would, would the gentleman yield? Uh, I enthusiastically support the amendment too, but I, uh, I ask how much money does it save this year, next year? We are uh, not exactly sure about that, but it, it, <laughs> it certainly will be a, uh, it, would, it would depend on what the recommendations came back with. Well, I don't think the recommendations would uh, would amount to any savings for next year. It might in years down yeah, the pipe. I mean, the, the, what this is doing, uh, there's been some question raised about LSOs, and what it's doing is, is, is doing it in an orderly manner. Uh, to see if there can be money saved, and if so, how much, and to regulate the financial affairs of the LSO. I am for the amendment. I think it's well, a good, good amendment, but it doesn't yeah. save any money, and I just wanted to well, point that out. Well, it will save money. Well, you know, every time I look at uh, at the Clinton budget, and I, I look at all the, uh, the new taxes, the new spending, and then I look at the spending cuts down the road, which we never will get, you know, I become... Uh, uh, you know, I have to question uh, this business. Listen, we'll Ronald, money down the Ronald road. Reagan and, and your man, <laughs> George Bush, signed more new taxes than any two presidents in the history of this nation. So oh, start talking to me about I would, that. Uh, I would question that. But um, go ahead and vote on your amendment. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Hey, Mr. Chairman, just to inquire of my friend from California. Uh, recently on the floor, we've been subjected to these lists of the number of open and closed rules, and I understand your, your concern about that. But in previous sessions, we've been subjected to similar lists about the number of waivers that we've granted. And do I understand you now to, to suggest that you would in, you, you support these, these same kind of waivers? And, no, uh, if, I don't know if my friend was here at the outset. The first amendment that I offered as we began marking up this rule was an amendment which would uh, basically strike all the waivers that are in this measure. So. No, I don't. I but but I, I, I do want you to be aware you, you may not have heard the motion. This this motion does require a waiver to allow this amendment to be considered. Right. Maybe I should. Would, the would, uh, would, would, would somebody to yield? Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, yield. You know, yeah, um, yield. I'll say to Mr. Who's got the floor? Well, I yield to Derek. Derek. Thank you very much. Um, I yield to you, too. Uh, in my opening statement, I made the point that, uh, that we on this side of the aisle are going to support uh, uh, not only the uh, waivers of the points of order that you are suggesting uh, or that appear in the bill that were put in by the Appropriations Committee, but also all of the other waivers as well for I, the simple reason we don't have an authoriz authorizing I, bill I, before us. I, I just wanted to be clear, that's, that's been pretty much the traditional reason why waivers are necessary, that the, right. that the authorizing bill hasn't reached the stage in the legislative process that it's available. But uh, I do appreciate it. I think it's a reasonable position from time to time. Would the gentleman from South Carolina yield? Be delighted uh, to yield. In, in the statement that my friend just made, uh, he indicated that there was some confusion on no. this Roberts Which Amendment. Which friend of this of yours made this statement? The, my, my very dear friend, the Chief Deputy Majority Whip, uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick, made the statement that there was some confusion on this amendment that was offered by Mr. Porter, stating that this was not, in fact, an amendment to the amendment that was proposed by uh, that's right. This is a freestanding amendment. This was a freestanding amendment that's right. that proposed by Mr. Roberts. That's right. And I've just been handed a copy of the testimony, which I didn't hear, that was provided by Mr. Porter, in which he clearly stated that it is, in fact, an amendment to the amendment proposed by Mr. Roberts. I stand by my original statement. Yeah, I'm just looking at the testimony that was submitted here. It has been revised as a freestanding amendment. By Mr. Porter? By Mr. Porter. Okay, I, I just wasn't aware of that because all I had was the testimony that he Glad to be here. informative, Mr. Dwyer. I thank you for informing me of that. May I ask Mr. Derrick a question? Mr. Mr. Derrick, you yield to me? I'd be delighted. My, my question is, we had uh, testimony here, somewhat impassioned, uh, from the, uh, the gentleman from the uh, Thames River Valley, who is a close friend of all of ours, Mr. Gadenson, and he is uh, conducting a, a study, and he uh, has uh, given us a 
mm, perhaps uh, three or four pounds worth of report uh, that says things are going to be happening with LSOs, and he's going to plan to report back in September, if I, if I heard right. Uh, what impact would this amendment have on his effort? Well, I think it would be uh, complimentary. Uh, I, I wondered if he thinks the same. He does. He thinks this is going to be complimentary. Well, that is very good. Be, I, well, he didn't. I think he just did testify to that, um, if I'm not mistaken. The, um, the re, you know, I'm not being facetious about this. Actually, one of the criticisms has been that this thing is a constant study. It's like the out year uh, deficit reduction steps. We never get to the cuts because we always ne we never get to the out years. It's the same kind of deal. Uh, We've got a date certain here of uh, January 1st of 94, and that's the intent, and that's what you would expect but this I, amendment I, to reflect. Know, I suppose I, I can't disagree with you entirely about that. There are many things that have been studied to death. Yeah. That is not the intention of this amendment, nor Thank do you. I uh, believe that, it, that that's what will happen. Thank you. Question comes on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes appear to have the motions adopted. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Aye. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bonnier. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Aye. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Nine members haven't voted in the affirmative. Uh, the motion is adopted. Mr. Chair. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Got a great idea from Mr. Frost when he was able to look at a package that was proposed by Mr. Grams and pull out one of the items that he found particularly attractive. And I looked at the amendment that was proposed by Mr. Inglis and found that his proposal would prohibit departing members of Congress from purchasing equipment other than their desk and chair uh, in their offices to take with them. Uh, a very worthwhile amendment. And I move that we make that provision in order. Question comes on the motion. All those Mr. Mr. Oh, Chairman, sorry, Mr. Wheat. Just to briefly inquire of my friend from California. I don't know if it requires a waiver or not. <laughs> uh, in fact, I suspect it, it, it might. But um, are are there public funds that are used? Because I'm not aware of it. That, that I think the, for, I think for members for members to purchase their furniture. I think the concern. I, I thought that was members were required to use their personal funds to. Right, no, they do, but I think the purchases. concern is that they're able to purchase this equipment at a dramatically reduced cost, uh, juxtaposed to someone in the private sector who would uh, be uh, purchasing this equipment. No, no, no. My understanding is that the furniture is put up for sale and yeah. it, a price is established, and the member has the first option, but if the member chooses not to make the purchase, that, that, that is the price that's, that's placed upon it. Uh, uh, Mr. Frost would no. probably know is that no, you don't know. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know. I've, I've read a couple of articles about it, and Mr. Inglis is simply maybe, maybe we can debate this Man, issue. I, on the I don't House. have any great objection to the amendment. I don't intend to vote for it. I just think it's yeah. misleading to suggest that members are given public funds for which to purpose purchase their furniture. Well, no, no, they're not. And, I, and, to, I, and to my knowledge, that's not. Yeah, the no, case. I don't think that it, it uh, indicates that members are given public funds. The, the statement on my sheet here from Mr. Inglis says to prohibit departing members from equipment purchases other than their desk and chair. And I infer from that that it means uh, using their own dollars to purchase equipment. Well, I, I, have, I have a slightly different chair. statement that and you know suggests what? I somehow the public funds I suspect it will come out very clearly if we have a full debate on it on the House floor. I'd Thank be happy you. to yield to my friend Thank from you. New York. Go ahead. And I've got one well, okay. Mr. Chairman, may I? Slaughter. I may have a different paper than you have, David, but what mine says is would prohibit funds in this act, which are public funds, to be used for the purchase of office furniture equipment by departing members. Now, is this, is this are you on the English amendment? Yeah. You're on the English amendment. 52. What? 52. Okay. That's well, that is different than the sheet that I had, but. Uh, yeah, well, the, uh, what does your sheet say, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, the gentleman. Uh, my, I read mine. Mine says, uh, would prohibit departing member equipment purchases other than desk and chair. Well, the, uh, well, the gentleman yield. may have well, the, the gen answer. gentleman yield. Uh, um, I was reviewing some notes on this subject. It's very interesting because, as the gentleman knows, I, I serve on right. the full House Administration Committee, and uh, my notes there. indicate that the uh, the subcommittee 
uh, has adopted committee regulations relating to the disposition of property in the offices of departing members. Full committee consideration of the regulations has been delayed until the next meeting of the committee at the request of the ranking minority member, Mr. Thomas, in order to give members the opportunity to address their concerns about these new regulations um, so that the, uh, the process has gone forward uh, by Mr. Gageson's subcommittee and it is only because it's only been delayed at this stage because of a request by the ranking minority member of the full committee. Well, I suspect that if Mr. Thomas were here and on this committee, he would uh, support Mr. Inglis's right to offer the amendment on the House floor, and I would uh, move that we make it in order. I would only, uh, only again say that this matter is proceeding through the House administration and uh, is uh, going to be considered very shortly as soon as Mr. Thomas uh, decides that we've had enough time to fully consider it. Thank you. May I ask? Happy uh, thank you, gentlemen. Yes. My understanding from the testimony today was there's a dual purpose in this. One was to save dollars, uh, and the other was to prevent office stripping, uh, which really is uh, unfair to constituencies. Uh, when you have a change of office, uh, usually a switch in parties is involved or some type of other uh, non comity type situation. Uh, and you, the public is not well served. And I think that the, the purpose of this amendment was to, A, provide better service to the public, prevent that kind of stripping. And secondly, uh, if I'm not, not mistaken, the exact testimony was to prevent the 10 cent on the dollar bargain sales that members are afforded. So uh, in answer to our colleague, Mr. Wheat, I, I think the answer is it's an indirect subsidy uh, that uh, the members uh, benefit from. And I think that uh, it was that subsidy uh, that Mr. Inglis was trying to get at. Mr. I believe Chairman, that was his intent. Mr. Chairman, be that as it may, whatever the actual facts are, the matter is being handled in an expeditious manner by the authorizing committee, by the Committee of Jurisdiction, House Administration. Question comes on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Do we have a record vote, Mr. Chairman? Call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bond. Mr. Wheat. I don't know. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this member, four members have on this motion. Four members have voted in the affirmative. Five of the negative. Motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we make in order the amendments presented by Mr. Klug. It's number 21 on my list. I have no idea what it is on any other list anybody else might be using. The Klug amendments uh, did two things. One was to cut the 5% across the board, as the Penny Amendment did, which uh, was offered by Mr. Solomon. Uh, but it also strikes 50% of GPL funds. Uh, the, te uh, the testimony was very clear uh, by Mr. Klug. I think he did an excellent job. Uh, pointing out two things to us. First of all, that uh, there's the opportunity for great savings, either through privatization or uh, other processes uh, in the GPO area. And secondly, on the 5% cuts across the board, I don't believe anybody has testified that, uh, that would be willing to state, and the question wasn't asked to every, every member who came forward, of course, but that there isn't some waste, some redundancy, some low priority yet to be cut out. And my suggestion is that any there is no single uh, expenditure that goes on under this appropriation of a dollar that couldn't stand a nickel saving in it. And it's therefore I move that make this motion. Question comes from the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Dirk. No. Mr. Beal. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bond. Mr. Hall. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Solom. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dryer. Aye. Mr. Goff. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members have voted in the affirmative, five in the negative. The motion, gentlemen, is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. I would like to make an order uh, the Boehner Amendment. Uh, and as a, as a point of order, I want to clarify that the Boehner Amendment uh, contains two uh, separate provisions, uh, e even though there was some confusion about. Uh, what it may say on somebody's list. And the two provisions I wish to uh, uh, address my motion to are the requirement for a quarterly report on expenditures of the architect of the Capitol, uh, and that would uh, be vice striking a 100,000 contingency fund for the architect of the Capitol, which has been struck on my list. And the second uh, amendment would be to ban all unsolicited mass mailings of 100 pieces or more. I realize that we've had 
uh, some amendments proposed on the uh, mass mailings, and we've actually adopted some savings, uh, but we have not addressed the issue of mass mailings. So I think this amendment is particularly in order. And uh, I, I did want to correct one uh, piece of uh, information which I may have heard, or perhaps uh, my uh, friend from uh, South Carolina misspoke or read from the wrong line. But that I, I am now looking at the official mail allowances list, which I believe is the same list the gentleman had, uh, and I see that my uh, percentage of expended funds of uh, frank mail allowance is uh, in the vicinity of 16 percent. Uh, and if I heard right, the, the gentleman uh, had some other number in mind for me. If I did, I was mistaken. I think uh, he said you had the same as I did. Is my I'm very pleased no, no, to be in. I believe Mr. he said Chairman. the same as Mr. Dreyer, and he did, he did mis uh, mistake. He was saying that you had expended approximately the same as Mr. Dreyer, and Mr. Dreyer has expended a considerable amount of money in excess of what you've spent. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. No, I... I... I, I, I <laughs> I thought he said that you and I spent about the same as... Uh, uh, Mr. I, Chairman, may, may I go right. back I to the matter at hand? Compared to Mr. Derrick, where do I stand here? Mr. Let's Mr. see. Mr. Uh, Chairman, there are two on my list. There are two uh, Boehner amendments. There is Boehner Amendment number 18 and Boehner Amendment number 29. Number 29 deals with the architect of the Capitol and number 18 deals with the issue of the franc. Is, the, is Mr. Goss suggesting that, uh, that these be considered in blocks? I am considering that uh, in the interest of time. That if the gentleman's preference is that we not do it that way, I will do them one by one. I would suggest to the gentleman it would be better if we could consider them separately. I will be happy to accede to that request. And in that case, Mr. Chairman, I would like to amend my move to make in order the Boehner amendments I read and start with the first one, which is to require the quarterly report on the expenditures of the architect of the capital, if that, in fact, is uh, in order on the basis of the testimony submitted to the committee. Fine. Question, uh, some Council. Just a week. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goss, it's my understanding that that amendment does re require a waiver, and, I, and uh, I assume that in your in your motion you're including the request for a waiver. I, if a, requ if a ra waiver is required in order to get a report of the uh, quarterly expenditures of the architect of the capital, uh, which I think is definitely in the public interest, I think it would be an excellent waiver. Needs a waiver of Clause 2, Rule 21. Uh, well, that would be uh, consistent with other uh, reasons uh, that we have uh, waived that uh, rule. Question My comes view. on the motion, the gentleman from Flower. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Mr. Gentleman. Chairman, on that, I would respectfully Mr. ask. Mr. Roll. Mr. Aye. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bunny. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. On this matter, nine members have not voted in the affirmative. The motion of General Flower is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would now like to move that we make in order the, uh, the uh, other Boehner Amendment, which I believe the gentleman from Texas is correct to me as another number on his list, but it's, I think we understand it's the ban on all unsolicited mass mailings, and that's 100 pieces or more definition of mass mailing. Is that consistent with the gentleman from Texas? Uh, thank you. I would like to make that motion. Order. question comes on that motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No, the no's appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bunyan. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillis. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members have a vote in the affirmative, five in the negative. The motion is not adopted. Zimmer amendment, which would allow excess congressional office funds to be used for deficit reduction. Question comes on the motion, gentlemen from Tennessee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's roll appear to have it. The motion's not adopted. The clerk call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Mr. Bielinson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bond. Mr. Hall. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Saul. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Matter, four members have not voted in the affirmative, five in the negative, the motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. First, I'd just like to clarify, the amendment that we just prohibited 
from being considered on the House floor was an amendment which would have said that excess funds in our official office accounts, rather than going to some other expenditure, um, could you know, not be used to pay down the uh, federal deficit. Is that right? Gentleman's correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I think yeah. This was not yeah, a recommendation from the little. Appropriations Committee. You know, the money goes back into the general treasury. It's going to go it's to the deficit reduction money. anyway. This, uh, this uh, uh, amendment is nothing but a charade to try to trick people into thinking you're doing something when you're not doing anything. Well, you know, because it goes to deficit reduction. There's anyway. always been well, a great deal of confusion. I'm happy to yield. I, you know, I think this discussion always breaks down yeah. as though people are concealing money somewhere. The fact is it never leaves the Treasury. If it's mm -hmm. not spent, it stays there. Well, it seems to me that this amendment would be something that would reaffirm the fact that well, it would be used to deal with the Well, that's the way it is. If it's not it's spent, it's not drawn a down. It's a trite amendment because what it, that is already happening. I'm happy to yield to my friend. That is already Let's happening. Balls. This money excess in accounts goes to deficit reduction because it never leaves the Treasury to begin with. Happy to yield to my friend from Glens Falls, and then well, I'd like to offer an amendment. After. Sorry, you I know, this up. We've already debated this uh, uh, earlier. We debated it during the thing, and, uh, you know, both clarifying. Uh, Mrs. Slaughter is right and Mr. Dreyer is right. They both are right. But the, the truth of the matter is that all of the money that I have returned nice to, to, great to the Treasury, uh, that money never went back to reducing the deficit. That money was, uh, for all intents and purposes, reprogrammed and used for something else. And uh, uh, all this does is is force belt tightening on this Congress. Now, that is an absolute Solomon, fact, which everybody admits to. That is not correct. Well, it is correct. correct. It never leaves the Treasury. Let's take a vote is, on it. And that is a charade for you to suggest otherwise. Uh, now, be careful. <laughs> be careful there, Floyd. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for having brought this up. I didn't know that I was going to cause such a stir Scott, here. This actually is after the fact. This amendment's right. already been disposed of. Yeah, I understand of. that. I just was clarifying it. Trying to well, clarify. I, I, mean, I don't I'm know more if confused than the, I was when I asked for the clarification. I, I don't know if the, the clarification well, clarified very anything. Very enlightening. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we consider and block uh, the amendments that were proposed by uh, Mr. Thomas of Wyoming, which cuts the General Accounting Office by 5%, cuts the Government Printing Office by an amount uh, detailees to Congress now cost. I assume he's got a list there. I haven't, I haven't uh, seen that. Um, the amendment offered by Mr. Ewing, which would cut maintenance funds for House buildings by 10%. The amendment offered by Mr. Hefley, which would eliminate funding for the Joint Committee on Taxation, and the amendment by uh, Mr. offered by Mr. Bunning, which would strike funding for the Joint Economic Committee, and I move that all four of these amendments be considered and blocked. Oh, they're f okay. Well, I guess uh, Thomas has two amendments. Okay, so the two Thomas amendments, and then the Ewing, Hefley, and Bunning amendments. So those five amendments be considered and blocked. Question comes on the motion, the gentleman from California. Are all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's appear to have the motion not adopted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielson. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members haven't voted in the affirmative, five in the negative, the motion is not adopted. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, there are a number, number of uh, amendments which we, we could offer, but uh, I'm sure they would meet the fate of, uh, of uh, all of the uh, significant cutting amendments that have been offered here tonight. And I, I really have to take exception to my good friend uh, Butler Derrick's uh, uh, terminology of charade because um, you know, if you want to talk about charades, and uh, if there's any press here, I don't know, but uh, I hope you've kept there's track. There's press here. We've been on C-SPAN uh, well, all day. Well, I'm talking about the written press here, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. But uh, seriously, you know, uh, we have approved at this point, out of the 50-some-odd amendments that have been, been uh, offered here uh, by legitimate members of Congress who, who came before this committee in all sincerity, we've approved six. Now, six may seem uh, like a lot out of 50, <laughs> which it isn't, but we've approved six amendments. And again, I'm just going to run down because to show you what a charade this entire 10 hours has been, and I'm getting a little exercised about it. We approved a Shepherd Amendment, which saves zero dollars this coming year. We approved a Pomeroy Amendment, which uh, uh, both of these are Democrat amendments, which my good friend Mrs. Slaughter corrected me and said saves 7.5 million instead of uh, 5.8. So 
There's one amendment that does save $7.5 million out of a budget. That's incorrect. It, it's only 5.8. The amendment addresses 5.8 million, I believe the gentlelady okay. from New York will admit. I was but the committee has already cut 1.7. That's not what Mr. Solomon is saying, Mr. He's Chairman. Talking about amendments that are offered. He's talking about the savings in the amendments. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Uh, let me just continue. We approved a third amendment, a Democrat amendment by Mrs. English, which could save 1.5 million. Let's say it saves the whole amount. So now we're up to maybe eight or nine million dollars out of a budget of 1.8 billion dollars. Then we approved a Graham's amendment uh, for debate saves zero dollars, a Porter Amendment, which saves zero dollars, and a Boner amendment, Boehner Amendment, which saves zero dollars. So out of six amendments that we are making in order, we're saving somewhere around, maybe if they're passed on the floor, eight or nine million dollars out of the hundreds of millions of dollars in amendments that were offered before this body. I will say to my good friend Butler Derrick, that is a charade in itself. Uh, this has been nothing but an act for the people that are watching. Uh, when we go on the floor tomorrow, uh, I'm sure that the members who have wasted their time coming up here and testifying are on both sides of the aisle are going to be outraged uh, that their amendments aren't even going to be allowed to be considered. This is the first time in 203 years that this has happened last year and this year. And I just think that's a shame. I think uh, we reached a new low on this committee. Will the gentleleman yield? Mr. Now, Dern. Well, first, I have oh, to yield to my good friend, Mr. Dreyer. The only point that I would like to make is that Mr. Natcher was right. And I would yield to my good friend, Mr. <laughs> Derrick. I thank the gentleman for yielding. What uh, you failed to point out, Mr. Solomon, was that uh, about 18 or 19 million dollars had already been cut out of this, not below what was requested substantially more than that was cut out below what was requested, but below what was actually appropriated and spent uh, last year. So to say that uh, the only cuts have been made, uh, as you outlined, and that there are additional cuts. Those were the only cuts that we made tonight, but there are additional cuts. It was worked over by the committee process before it ever received here. And I think the fact that it didn't go up and the fact that it was cut 19, uh, million in addition to what we did here tonight is substantial progress. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, reclaiming my time, uh, there is one last amendment. Uh, we did have uh, of those uh, uh, 40 odd, odd number of uh, members that came before this body, there was another Democrat member on your side of the aisle, a very respected member, who had asked for several amendments to be made in order. One of those amendments that he had requested to be made in order would do this. And this would mean real savings. As a matter of fact, it would total about $14 million. And if we were to allow this amendment to go to the floor and we were to pass it, it means even after the $19 million in cuts that you say the appropriators have made, Mr. Derrick, if we added this $14 million to it for a total of $33 million, we would be cutting the legislative appropriation bill by less than 2%. What his amendment would do would reduce House leadership funds by $866,000. It would reduce the committee employees by $6.6 million. That's just a drop in the bucket. It would reduce standing committee funding by a mere $552,000. That's a drop in the bucket. And it would reduce salaries for officers and employees by $4.45 million. You add all that up and uh, uh, I have an amendment. Uh, it's Mr. Orton of uh, Utah, and um, Mr. Chairman, there's no sense going into detail because I know the fate of this amendment. It's a good amendment. Uh, it ought to be debated on the floor, and I would move the amendment. Uh, the gentleman would uh, allow me I'd to, be glad to say you. something before you move it. You know, we all want to have as efficient a legislative process as we possibly can of the, uh, it, and spend as little of the taxpayers' money as possible. But also, at the same time, we want to do an efficient job, and we want to deliver for our country and for the needs of our citizens. Unfortunately, I guess, that can't be done for free. People who come to work here in the government must be paid, supplies must be bought, and one thing and another. Now, the leadership of the House, and I'm not sure about this next statement, but I think probably in agreement with the minority, 
have, have, have agreed to cut about 25 percent out of the uh, cost of, of the operation of this institution over the next uh, four or five years. And it will be done in an orderly way, in a manner that will not disrupt the legislative process and not disrupt government. We are starting uh, on that process here this year, and I think it is something that we need to be uh, very pleased with. You know, during the 1980s, the, uh, the number of employees in, in this body uh, went down, and the cost went down, while in the administration uh, it went up. So during the 1980s, the, I think this body began uh, looking towards this. The, the administration has, has once again said that they're going to cut. I don't know how much. They're finding it very difficult, I'll admit, uh, to do it. But uh, I think this is an orderly process, and I think it's uh, something that we should follow through with. Uh, I would like to, uh, gentlemen here. Yeah. Uh, the uh, appropriation, Legislative uh, Committee on Appropriations uh, was given a mandate by the leadership to come in and make some real cuts. And, and, and these weren't paper cuts, these weren't projections, these weren't from budget estimates, these were cuts below the 1993 budget, actual cuts. $10.4 million under the 93 appropriations in the office of the clerk. $7.8 million uh, under the U.S. Capitol Historic Society. Uh, $1.9 million uh, for franking. Uh, beside the $5.8 million. Uh, GPO uh, uh, was cut uh, for 53, 46 below the 94 request. Uh, $100,000 on the White House Buildings account. $5.2 million, $5 million on standing and select committees. Uh, the Library of Congress, $1.9 million below 1993. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So actually, the, uh, the, the Committee on Legislative Appropriations really did a job. And of course, it's very easy for members to come up and say, let's have a 25% cut and let's have another uh, cut here. But uh, we have to be able to operate. And, and many people don't know, and I'm sure the gentleman from New York knows because the gentleman from New York is well informed, but uh, uh, there are a lot of matters that are put into the legislative appropriation bill that aren't really legislative appropriations, like the Library of Congress and, and, and some other things. And, uh, and this is probably one of the, you know, even though it's, it's a large budget, it's probably one of the, the smallest budgets, uh, 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 relatively small budget. So I, I just think that uh, maybe some of the amendments uh, uh, weren't adopted tonight, but it was because the cuts had already been made in that, that uh, specific uh, area. And to, uh, as uh, the uh, gentleman from uh, South Carolina stated, that uh, we have uh, uh, got a five-year project to reduce our budget by 25 percent, and, and this first step is a great first step. Uh, all of us would like to reduce it uh, as low as we can, and, and that's what we're trying to do. But we don't want to reduce it so low that uh, the uh, legislative process will be hampered in any way. And, and I know it's a question of uh, priorities and it's a question of uh, how people feel about certain items, but I just think that uh, uh, the Appropriations Committee did a good job and, and uh, with the additional uh, amendments we made in order, I, I, I think that the uh, cuts would be substantial. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, re reclaiming my time, and uh, you know the respect that I have for you, and I know that uh, w when you say, uh, read these figures, that you, you believe that they are significant, and, uh, and that's fine. Mr. Michael, uh, in his submitted statement earlier today, had uh, said, uh, uh, he inferred that, uh, for instance, Mr. Fazio, a very respected member of your body who has uh, been the subcommittee chairman on the legislative branch appropriations for years, uh, has done a, a, a yeoman's job. And he, in years past, has been willing to take the bill to the floor, and he's been willing to justify those expenditures. And that what, that's what Bob Michael was talking about in his statement, that if these figures are, are right, let's take them to the floor and, and, and let's, let's justify them. And you're going to get votes for them on our side of the aisle as well. But there are members of this body that believe that we can cut deeper, that we can set a better example, 
uh, to eliminate some of the, uh, the growth of the, uh, of the legislative body. And we're just not doing it. And we're, we're gagging these members. These six little piddling amendments uh, just don't amount to anything. And we all know it. And uh, uh, I think that's wrong. I think you ought to approve this amendment. At least that would show uh, that we were at least uh, trying to be fair to, uh, to even a member of your side of the aisle. And I would move the amendment. Question comes on the Otten Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's appear to have it. Clerk call will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Mr. Bielson, Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bunyan. Mr. Hall. Mr. Weiss. Uh, Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Close. Aye. Mr. Dryden. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Matter, four members haven't voted in the affirmative, five in the negative, the motion not adopted. Any other amendments? Mr. Chairman, we have a number of amendments, but uh, we know what the fate is going to be, so we will uh, yield back, and uh, you may make your motion if you wish. Question comes on the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Aye. Mr. Bielensen. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bonya. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Aye. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Solomon. No. Mr. Quill. Mr. Dryer, no. Mr. Goss, Mr. Chen. No. no. Aye, I'm sorry. I <laughs> well, sit, almost sit, had him sitting too close to Mr. Solomon here. Uh, the uh, the eyes have it. The, the the rule will be handled by Mr. Frost on the majority side. And Mr. Solomon will be very glad to carry for the minority. And Mr. Solomon will be very glad to carry for the major, major, minority. And look out. And look Mr. out. Chairman, what's our schedule for uh, we've. I think we're going to have all. Yeah, we have the Nassau authorization, but I, I uh, you know, t this is June, and June is the, the month of appropriation bills, and we're going to be very, very busy uh, all month long. Yeah, we anticipate that early next week. No. Mr. Chairman, uh, what... Uh, right. Yeah, we, the amendments on the strike or replacement bill have to come to us on Friday. You've got a not notice of that. Mr. Chairman, yes, but uh, again, review with me uh, two things. Uh, the time schedules for tomorrow and what we're going to be taking up and uh, where we stand on the foreign uh, aid uh, foreign, foreign operations aid. bill and whether uh, foreign the payments aid. are going to be asked for on that. Foreign aid and appro uh, appropriations bill will be coming up next week. Yeah, I'm going to make a, as soon as I get downstairs, I'm going to make an announcement that uh, amendments on foreign aid oper uh, authorizations come to us by noon tomorrow. And, and then when, when, when might we be meeting in, in the Rules Committee to consider that bill? Um, possibly Monday. Yeah, possibly Monday. Po possibly. Mm -hmm. Is there some... Uh, There's going to be, and it's a question of question. foreign aid authorization and foreign aid appropriation. Appropriation. And the strike, strike is replacement in the maybe NASA okay. Treasury Postal. Okay. In my uh, my conversations with uh, uh, Mr. Gilman and Mr. Michael and others, there uh, do I understand there may be a possibility we may have two rules on the foreign aid foreign operations bill, which might there is a there is a possibility. Yeah. So that we would take up uh, one rule would deal with general debate, and another would deal with the Gen amendment process later in the week? Gentleman is correct. Okay, and tell me again, uh, I'm sorry to hold you up, but no, what are we, what time are we meeting tomorrow and on what? Yeah, one thirty tomorrow on NASA. On NASA, and that's the only thing tomorrow so far we'll be meeting on. So far. Thank you okay. very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The legislative branch appropriations bill is expected to be debated on the House floor during Thursday's session. 
A Senate version of the bill, which includes money for that chamber, will be voted on at some future point. Then the two versions will be considered by a conference committee. The Democratic leadership in the House has said it hopes to pass all 13 appropriations bills before the July 4th recess. Send your comments to the House Rules Committee. The address is H312, U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C., 20515. This Sunday on Book Notes, David Brock, an investigative reporter for the American Spectator, will be the guest. He'll discuss his recent book, 